So, I have lived in England since 1987. I work in London as an artist and as a professor of cross-disciplinary art at Sheffield Hallam University, where my work explores artistic strategies in relation to different areas of knowledge. I'm born in Aarhus, but I moved to Aarhus, from Aarhus to Frista and Christiania when I was quite young. Um, and I'm, like many, quite few other people here, I'm um, also involved in the uh, CRIR uh, project, which is a really difficult um, uh, name, um, but it means the Christiania Research and Residence Programme. And um, it was started in 2004, and we were just discussing it upstairs in one of the seminars, so I kind of missed the last part, which was actually about the, the Christiania Research and Residence Programme, so I don't know what was said. But I know that one thing that's important for me to say is that it was started um, at that time, 2004, because we felt that there was very little reflection happening around Christiania. It was very much a media thing, the way Christiania was reflected upon in Denmark, and there was very little real research that had gone into Christiania and what has really happened there, especially in terms of um, urban planning and things that have worked and haven't worked. Um, so we decided to create a kind of place, a, a platform. Um, gosh, I, I can suddenly hear I have a really bad Danish accent. It's your fault. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> um, but it was so it was an attempt to make a different kind of platform for artists and researchers from around the world to learn and critically reflect on Christiania as a very different urban space. The Christiania Research and Residence program, program was also set up to ensure that the research into Christiania happening from, from, from researchers that would come from all over the world would not just leave Christiania to be published in external academic journals, but that there was a way to anchor the research in Christiania so that people and residents in Christiania who were the objects of the research could also benefit from, from the kind of critical reflection of it. But I'm not going to speak about Christiania here, I'm going to speak about water and the things I did after I moved from Christiania. But I think it's fair to say that a lot of the things that I have been doing has been quite influenced by Christiania. So for many of us who grew up here in Aarhus, the harbour, was, the harbour of Aarhus was never really a conscious part of our sense of the city. It was that visually and culturally disconnected from the rest of the city. So I'm probably not the only one who never really considered Aarhus as a major international port. This fact suddenly dawned on me uh, years later, after I moved away, when I saw a screening of the Aarhus-based documentary filmmaker Katrine Bohr's film, The Girl in the Harbour. Katrine Bohr made the film when she became curious about the invisibility of the seafarers aboard the giant cargo ships that were moving like distant worlds in and out of the industrial port and she started visiting and filming the crews aboard the ships. She met Burmese, Pakistani, Filipino and Russian crews who were confined to staying on the ships for months on end, often lonely, missing their families and homes and unable to go to shore when visiting the, the ports. When she spent Christmas with a Filipino crew aboard one of the ships, the ship was visited by a group of wives of retired Ohu seafarers. They brought Christmas presents that they had knitted for the foreign crew members. This is apparently an old tradition in Aarhus Harbour, and a really lovely one. But it is certainly not something that is common knowledge in Aarhus. It was only then that it suddenly occurred to me that Aarhus, of course, is an ancient port with a very, very long maritime cultural history. And today, it's Denmark's largest port in terms of turnover and volume of cargo. This makes makes it even more extraordinary that everyday maritime culture has been so totally removed from everyday life in Aarhus. The cultural and human history of the port has become a separate culture and so has the sense of Aarhus being part of a sea-based maritime culture connected to the rest of the world. It's my opinion that not even the recent years planning and architectural development of the port has managed to embrace a real understanding of Aarhus harbour as living heritage or as a living cultural maritime space. And it seems to me that Aarhus continues to be, to be confined by water, 
rather than embraced, connected and enabled by the water that surrounds it and the human emotional history that is connected with this urban space. Um, I would like to take you on a journey to other harbours and some projects that in different ways address alternative uses of urban water space from a cultural heritage as well as artistic and activist, activistic uh, approach. And also as projects that have been developed from a very lived rather than academic experience on the urban waterways in England and in Europe. Um, so I hope they can in different ways contribute to what we have been talking about today and also will be talking about tomorrow. I've lived on the River Thames in central London for the past 12 years. This has been a very particular experience. The part of the Thames where I've lived is called the Upper Pool and is next to Tower Bridge. It's a fierce and complex part of the river with violent washes, a tide rising and dropping up to eight meters twice a day and an extreme current racing in and out to the extent that if you fall in, then survival would be very tricky on this part of the river. You can therefore imagine the seriousness involved in moving large ships and making sure that they're properly secured. There's no room for amateurism and living on the water here is a serious business. The Thames is fierce like the sea in central London. It's here um, on the south side of Tower Bridge that a boat-obsessed architect called Nicholas Lacey started to build his dream of a garden square in the middle of the Thames. He discovered that with a river-facing building that he had bought came the right, an ancient right, of ownership to a large part of the river. He started to anchor old barges to the ancient chains on the bottom of the river, but this proved controversial with the Port of London Authority. And, al and although they've tried to stop him realise his plans for many years through the courts, he's just kept going. He claimed that his ancient rights to the river existed before there even existed such a thing as a river authority. These rights on the Thames are called ancient mooring rights, and it's a typical lawless situation for the Thames where regulations are often blurry and, un and unchanged for hundreds of years. This makes the Thames a kind of a wild west, um, in a way. Through the years, Nicholas Lacey has built this floating garden square out of, an out of old, empty, ex-commercial cargo hulls without engines. They're called lighters, which is a term on the Thames. They are historic to the Thames, and when the Thames was still a working harbour, rumour had it that you used to be able to walk across the river on lighters and Thames barges between the north and the south of the river. This is the, an, an, a historic picture of exactly where he's um, uh, building his garden square. It's also the site of a lot of the, um, the Charles Dickens, um, the Oliver, uh, Oliver Twist film. Um, he started to anchor old barges to the ancient chains on the bottom of the river, but, oh, I've, sorry, I've told you, <laughs> so I list of this. Um, Nick Lacey transformed his lighters into floating gardens that look like small bits of paradise in the middle of the Thames, with huge trees, beehives, fruit orchards, hiding places, vegetables and flowering gardens. And below the gardens, he built um, cargo spaces into, pe into places for people to live in. The garden barges were chained to each other and anchored to the bottom of the river, which enabled them to flux and move together up and down and sideways with a fierce current and act as a floating infrastructure for the ships that came to moor all around them. Over the years, this fluctuating structure has become a kind of organism, a village of about 100 people living there that moves up and down with the tide. To most people, these luscious, beautiful gardens in the middle of the Thames was an inspiring example of how you can also imagine the Thames, a small bit of utopian dreaming built on maritime heritage and self-built culture in the middle of a roaring and increasingly gentrified city. Fearlessly, or some would call it recklessly, Nick Lacey also established a working shipyard here, right bang in the centre of London, with hammering, grinding, welding, cutting and, and banging, and all that goes with it. But all around this bit of wild, overgrown, semi-industrial river life was now expensive housing for very wealthy people, and they didn't want historic barges on the river. 
Nearly everywhere else, on the up and down the Thames, the facilities for vessels, moorings and shipyards have been forced to move out of London. And today, most of this maritime history which built London has gone. And river use is mainly restricted to commercial tourism, with little variation in vessels moving on the Thames. The Thames down river is not a space where the public is welcome. This is um, a picture of, of one of the, the ships on, on, on the moorings, um, which used to be a, um, an old um, a kind of shipyard inside the ship. It was so full of um, uh, equipment for repairing ships, like generators as big as, as rooms and forklift trucks, and that the, the two people who moved into the ship didn't have any money and they couldn't um, uh, afford to take all this stuff out. They didn't have a mooring uh, when they bought the ship. It was 42 meters long. The regulations said you, you can you're free to move a 42 meter ship on the Thames without a license. So they moved around the ship, moored it up in the middle of the river and had to hitchhike uh, up with other ships to get to land until they came to Nick Lacey's moorings. Um, when you live on water, you learn that, that you're hugely dependent on local water-based knowledge and skills that have been passed through many generations. The working Thames has always been a close community with unwritten rules and traditions carried by the watermen and lightermen. They are the men whose families have worked at Thames for centuries and their education on the river is a seven-year-long apprenticeship. They were once a powerful working-class tribe, proud of their royal connections and ancient customs. But since London's docks shut down and European regulations started to destroy their 450-year-old tradition of apprenticing their sons into the river trade, their jobs have been drying up and new skipper license regulations has meant that their traditions are under threat. This disappearing knowledge of the river can literally be felt when you live on it. I lived at Ligula's Laces Moorings uh, for three years. At low tide, our barges would sit on the bottom of the Thames. The mud that was exposed is an archaeological site. The remains of old London, human bones, old pottery and ma masses of clay pipes used by centuries of barge workers and watermen. The low tide is therefore an exclusive experience of inhabiting a timeless and unexplored London, a landscape of the past where you can peer into the city's ancient wooden foundations. At high tide, the barges will rise up to a very different landscape and the pulsing restless groan of a global city. The different tides of the Thames have their own personality. At high, wa wa at high water, on a spring tide, there is a sense of tension, a sense of volume and mass of the river. It can feel angry, and then it changes, becomes slow and then gentle, especially the, in the upper pool. Further up river, the tide is different. It creeps up on you, slowly and with a different emotion. And all these different moods are marked by bridges. You need to know about the depths and the locations of weird standing waves and turbulences when you navigate. London Bridge especially has a weird turbulence. So the river is made up of these tensions, forces, a lot of urban tensions. Inevitably, the new residential apartments surrounding Nick Lacey's moorings teamed up with the local council and the port authority to try to remove Nick Lacey's moorings. We were handed eviction notices by the Port of London Authority. We spent three years fighting eviction, battling for the right for historic ex-working barges to remain part of the central London landscape. These are images of some of the evidence we brought to the public inquiry to prove that there were always barges and people living on boats on the site in central London. We had to prove um, that, for example, this one is a postman that used to bring letters uh, to the people who lived on the barges. And this is some of the children who lived on the barges. So this was some of the evidence that we brought to the case. Um, our legal battle generated debate in London about the ownership of and rights of access to the Thames, to a shared history that is disappearing and the right of ownership to a particular view of the river. It led to an outcry from a public who felt that access to the Thames had become privatised and from generations of families who had made their living on the river and felt that they were being cut off physically and visually by privatisation of the riverfront. 
These were not just river people in London, but water families across the country, but also famous people such as Captain Picard from Star Trek. I don't know if you know him. <laughs> he's not actually a captain, he's just called Captain Picard <laughs> in Star Trek, who had bought his um, flat especially to overlook these moorings. And even London's Mayor Ken Livingstone supported. And in September 2004, we won a public landmark inquiry where the planning inspector ruled that permissions should be granted for the vessels to stay. He wrote, the characteristic of this area is that of a 19th century townscape that owes its being in essence to the presence of a navigable trading river. The vessels do provide a maritime flavor which has not been lost through their conversion to residential use in a location which is close to what is arguably the historic heart of our maritime consciousness as a trading nation. Many of us who lived on this moorings were artists. We were inspired by the unregulated unreg wilderness we lived in. We had become part of a river community, a very old and exclusive community, and we knew the unwritten rules and were able to navigate the Thames with our huge ex-working cargo ships with massive spaces inside. So there were so many possibilities for us. We felt like pioneers, and because of our outspoken political campaign, we had become well connected and respected by the working river. But we were also amazed why so few Londoners had access to the water, and why so little imagination was invested in the Thames. People couldn't understand that it was actually legal to, to be in the Thames, that it was a shared space. We started to develop ideas through films and events we organized from a floating stage in a cargo space cinema. And some of us decided to try and build a new kind of harbor, a cooperative harbor, something which had never been seen in the Thames before. We had seen many huge ideas and initiatives come always to go again in the Thames, usually because they were drawn up in offices by people who, who had no lived knowledge of the river and its com communities and its culture and its decision-making processes. And we started to look up and down the river for feasible sites. We imagined building a living harbour, not for houseboats. We saw houseboats as disconnected from the river and associated with property speculation. We wanted navigable, navigable vessels and we wanted to build a mobile community. We wanted to explore this romantic idea of water as an expa expanded, freely navigable and creative cultural space. And we imagined building other harbours connected to a network of like-minded harbours around Europe. We imagined a network of cultural projects that would move around Europe in a whole different nomadic way of life. Through our, our powerful political campaign over the past three years, where we had successfully fought off local government, the port authorities and huge commercial interests in favour of the right to keep old historic barges in central London. We had become famous among people in the waterways across the whole country. And it was probably for this reason that an old waterman handed us his rights to a large area of the Thames right opposite our old moorings on the northeastern side of Tower Bridge. So basically this whole area um, from where you see the corner down of the, of the edge and land, and then all the way until you see something in front of our Tower Bridge, we were basically given. Um, there had been a working mooring on the site, an ancient working wharf, for hundreds of years, but there was no access to land, and so again we ended up in several years of political and legal battles to gain planning permission just to get access to a strip of public land. We also needed uh, permission from the Environment Agency, and we also needed permission from the Queen of England, as the land on the bottom of the Thames is hers when it appears at low tide, but only when it appears. This land is also an archaeological site so to drill in piles into the ground required environmental testing, but the main battle was with the Berlin Wall of, a new, of new luxury flats lining the river that insisted on a view of the Thames with no maritime heritage. Exclusive properties with exclusive views seemed to want people excluded from that view. And some of them even claimed that we would bring tropical diseases back into London. 
They tried to block our access to a public right of way, old waterman stairs. There are very few regulations on the Thames, and it's often confusing what rules apply and who governs. The point where land and ends and water begins therefore becomes a fascinating legal place. What licenses are applicable for things that come from the water and apply to land? And as river people, we existed that gray, that the sort of gray, wild, or unlicensed and unregulated area, which felt on one hand very liberating, like living in a parallel city, but also made it impossible for us to gain the right of access to this land for our gangway to reach a public way in between some of the most expensive areas of London. It took us five years to gain access to a small strip of land, develop a legislative stru cooperative structure, and design and build the physical harbour infrastructure, bespoke pontoons, a mooring design for an extremely turbulent environment with advice from river families on what would work, and the first not-for-profit cooperatively owned mooring on the Thames. This mooring is now called Hermitage Moorings and it has become a model for the Port of London Authority for a different non-commercial way to think about the use of the river. Everybody living here in this mooring are qualified skippers um, and all the ships are navigable. It's flat bottom barges that can sit on the bottom of the Thames at low tide. When you live on an old working ship like that, you develop an extremely strong connection to its past history. There's a sense of continuity, a sense of responsibility, and the ship starts to feel like a living thing, like a process. And this sense of respect for traditions of shipbuilding and generations of families that have lived their lives on your ship was an important element for us and what we wanted to do. Hermitage Moorings is six years old now. There are 20 ships on the mooring and around 50 people living here. We built a shared floating house that we use as an office, storage space, waste storage, pump out facility, and as a venue for parties and events. We have a charity which run various projects with the moorings, a mooring manager, and two berths for visiting ships that support the local river community and have ships visiting from around the world. The income we get fund the charity's educational and cultural projects on the river and life on the mooring. It also feeds projects to the local community. It's projects with uh, dis disadvantaged young people in the area, local schools, river archaeology projects, films, documenting life on the Thames, events on the Thames, and various uh, maritime research projects, such as whale research in the Thames estuary. We also host historic restoration projects like the Russian tall ship replica of Peter the Great's warships Standard and their plans to build an, a new navigable Cotisac. And every summer, a convoy of the ships travel out to form a floating island near the sea. And it's an extraordinary thing to be part of a, a mobile, a thing that move, moves mobile en, en masse. So we've achieved some of our original ideas, and the particular mobile, mobile living structure we have developed is unique for London. Um, but there's a lot more that could be done. While we were constructing our new harbour, I lived in the port of Rotterdam. I had bought a 28-metre ship, half a two-hulled catamaran ferry from 1932. It was split into two ships in a strange ship funeral ritual in the city of Nijmegen in 1938. The part of the cargo ship that I bought had since then become a steam vessel and then a German war provision ship, which was sunk when the Germans escaped after the war ended. It was then, strangely, rescued after two years at the bottom of the sea by the same man who had originally turned it into a steam barge. He was a skipper called Mr. Dane. Mr. Dane restored the ship and turned it into a dry cargo ship, and he lived on it with his family for many years, transporting dry cargo around Holland and Belgium. This was Mr. Dane and his wife. I spent three years restoring the ship in, in Rotterdam. I planned to turn the huge cargo space into a space for cultural projects on the Thames. It was a massive restoration project. But when I was finally ready to take a ship down through Holland and Belgium and across the sea to London, I discovered that throughout these years in Holland, I had been shadowed by a nearly 100-year-old woman. This was Mrs. Dane. <laughs> She had raised the family and lived on the ship most of her life until she was forced to move on to land when Mr. Dane died. 
For three years, she had secretly documented everything I had done to her ship, to the extent that when I was away, she would ask her family to enter the ship and take pictures inside. And in this way, she would build up an archive of everything I had done during those three years in Rotterdam. After meeting her, I felt like I was playing a part in a film, that my life had become strangely entangled with a family that I didn't know. And this was just one family, there was another one. Strangely, also a woman who had survived her man and searched for her ship for many years. I realized that this emotional attachment to a ship is not unusual for older generations of barge people that are forced to move on land after never having lived on, on a land before, and either have their parents often or their parents before them. They're emotionally attached to a mobile object, a vehicle, rather than a geographic location. They have lived very different parallel lives as moving families, mooring up their ships outside schools for barge people, gypsies and travelers, dropping the children off, mooring up outside the school weeks later, picking the children up. They have floating churches, specific rituals and saints for the waterways. And in France, they even have their own graveyards. When they have family gatherings, they moor up their ships together to form an island and celebrate. Living aboard a ship in the port of Rotterdam is an experience of a parallel city that moves. To go shopping, you can moor up your ship outside the shop, tied, uh, tied along a huge cargo vessel just passing through on its way into the huge European canal system, or huge cargo ships from around the world that arrive right bang in the, in the middle of the city. Cheap coffee beans are delivered by a ship from South America and is ground and sold in the shipyards, along with huge um, chains and anchors and ropes, and a an parallel economy applies to people on water where your passport is your cargo book, even it's from 1938. Hundreds of years of traditional barge culture, skills and, traditional, and traditions coexist and merge here with the commercial and industrial freight culture. Like the Thames, the Mars River is fast flowing and wild, but it's culturally so much more alive. Holland has understood to maintain its historic maritime knowledge by enabling an affordable, diverse and lively culture of living on and restoring old vessels. Restorations of, restoration of ships can take place not, not just on huge expensive industrial shipyards, but on DIY shipyards, or on ships that function as workshops for skilled craftsmen, where traditions are passed on and communities are built around these places, where ships come and moor up as work is done and move on when the job is finished. Retired barge workers are employed to restore ves old vessels, harbour equipment and pass on knowledge. This fluid process of skills and knowledge, exchange and heritage is mingling with a living industrial culture, but it's not exactly thriving, but it's still um, very much alive in mainland Europe. And that is where families have lived, worked and moved across borders on this huge river canal system for generations and developed a very specific water-based culture that is unknown to most people. But these old ways of life are becoming increasingly untenable because of European regulations that have been based on strict German marine laws. What comes close to such places here in Aarhus is prob probably a place called Traskudhavn, for those of you who don't know it. But this small self-organized harbor, although it's thriving and is also developing new initiatives, is now surrounded by new investment and expensive housing, as in a very vulnerable situation as it stands out with temporary improvised atmosphere of self-build. The important space making and heritage, val heritage value of places like this tend to be misunderstood in city planning, where, re where regeneration tends to remove the particular DIY conditions and physical environment that inspire the individual initiatives that is the driving force in places like this. This is an ongoing failure of gentrified mar maritime contexts, where the value of placemaking, the shared communities and the social inclusion that is generated is generally not understood by planners, who tend to see the often messy appearance of self-organized community harbors as an obstruction to visions for the future. It's very easy to destroy the often vulnerable, vulnerable contexts where history, maritime skills, and often barely surviving knowledge overlaps and is exchanged between generations. 
In terms of maritime heritage, it requires a complex and sometimes humble understanding of this context as living entities, where heritage and traditions can only be kept alive in their making. Hovering above the city of Rotterdam is a huge neon sign by the Dutch poet Lucebeer from the poem The Very Old Sings. The sentence reads, all things of value are defenseless. I'm now going to talk about something very different, um, which is um, a project um, which has a lot of connections to what I've just talked about and this, this particular culture of the sea. And um, it's a project um, called Folkhorn Requiem, which, which means uh, Requiem for Tohorn. It was um, developed uh, up on the northeast coast of England and it was um, in 2013 and it was uh, commissioned for the National Trust, um, some of the in England, um, for Suda Lighthouse. Um, this is between, this project really involves the whole region up there, which is a very, very, has a very, very strong maritime history. This is Sunderland, this is Newcastle area. Um, this is the organization uh, called um, um, Trinity House, which owns all the lighthouses in the UK, which is, um, you can see here, ships moving around the UK. This is a computer that maintains all the um, maritime warning systems of um, England, and this is where they control their lighthouses. Um, I, real, I realized that these lighthouses were in the process of being turned off in terms of the foghorn um, warning system on these lighthouses, but that no one really knew about it. And when I spoke to people about it, they got very upset. I realized that each uh, foghorn in the UK has its own sound. And that sound is specific for that place, and it mixes the way the sound travels out over the sea, mixes with the, the landscape, and creates a whole sort of sound environment that it becomes a very emotional um, representative sound of, of that place and, and, and it's something people sort of carry with them and remember as the sound of their, of, of the, of their home. When people found out that the sound horns were being turned off, um, they got very emotional about it. And I became very interested in how you use the sound to communicate and, and sort of um, discuss um, and bring people together around a sense of belonging. I had the crazy idea that I wanted to create a requiem for the folk horn. And the idea was to make a piece of music on the North Sea that would be performed by 50 ships on the North Sea and three brass bands and a, and a folk horn. So it was obviously going to be really easy to do. <laughs> Sorry, this thing uh, sort of uh, tries to change the pictures on its own. It was a completely mad idea. Um, I had already been involved in, in a feasibility research on the River Tyne, and I had um, around um, the Tyne, the, the future of the Tyne, and I was very aware that Margaret Thatcher destroyed the whole shipbuilding industry up in the northeast, and that the, uh, the area has never really recovered, and that there has been this sense of huge loss of identity um, and pride in the area. It's never really recovered. You have the mining industry, um, the brass bands that are extraordinary bands, um, skilled bands that came out of the, the mining industry that Thatcher also closed down. Um, so I was interested in how this, this, how this folk horn in a, in a way symbolized a particular time and, and, and a place in history. Um, the problem was that this was the place, the most danger, dangerous place in the UK with the most shipwrecks. So to gather 50 ships in this exact location was just the most insane thing to do. Um, I had to um, try to plan how I could um, position the ships offshore in a safe way. And I started to work with um, um, a maritime school where we, we basically um, build a whole model of the whole entire areas. And, and as the ships came in as participants in this orchestra, they were basically modeled um, in this virtual environment and tested 
in all sorts of weather conditions to ensure that I could position them in an orchestra as close to each other as possible, even though it might become quite stormy. So this is the, some of the, the, this is the final orchestra position. Um, I spent two years in the area where I basically talked to um, the maritime community about the past and, and talked about this and, and I knew that this project could only really happen if people wanted it to happen because it was, it was the whole maritime community up there that was the performers in this orchestra. This is some of the shipyards there. This is a very big, huge working harbour and I wanted the harbour to be this big port to be involved in this, in this project as well. So it was the whole maritime community in the ports between Sunderland and Newcastle. I went out to sea uh, in the channel where you have hundreds of ships that are just basically based there for months on end and they some people say they're waiting for the oil prices to increase, the tanker ships, um, they have staff out there that just live there for months. I tried to board some of those tuple tankers to bring them in to be part, part of my orchestra um, without any luck. And I had the big problem that the um, harbour master of the port of Tyne didn't like this project. And I really liked him. <laughs> And he was a very important man, and I had this idea that he could bring in these big super tankers to, to form part of this event. Um, it took a long time to win him over, even though we had proved that the sounds could travel from far away, from miles out to sea, um, even in, in, um, in really high offshore winds. We basically developed a um, uh, a technology where each ship horn, which we had ship horns donated from a ship horn manufacturer in Sweden. Here we're testing them in an anechoic chamber. They were tuned. We developed ways of tuning them as instruments. So essentially each ship was an instrument on, it, on its own. Um, we then positioned these horns offshore on the ships and tested and tested and tested and nothing worked. And this project was becoming extremely famous. It was just written about everywhere, even the Wall Street Journal. Just everybody was getting more and more excited about this project, especially as none of the technology worked. The idea was basically that we would position these 50 ships offshore like an orchestra. The base was the huge DFDS Seaways Ferry, which already had 3,000 people booking to, 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 to to go out to sea to stay on the ferry during this performance. Um, and um, the brass bands were performing to a musical score by a really fantastic composer called Orlando Goff. He had composed a, a 50 piece, a 50 minute long piece of music um, for 50 ships, three brass bands, and a light horse folk horn. Um, the ships. Um, um, I get quite emotional when I see them now. <laughs> this was a particularly wonderful ship. A lot of them were involved in um, the shipwrecks. They were living from the shipwrecks uh, in the area. They were um, tracing treasures, secret treasures on the ships. They were diving from them. They were taking back metals from them. It was surprising that, that there was this connection with the, the old shipwrecks. These were became a huge movement of everybody wanting to take part in this project, and even the harbour master um, got very involved in it. Um, it was everything from government inspection vessels to little fishing vessels to rowing boats to harbour vessels. And um, on the day when the performance was happening, the way the, the technology was working was that the ships were positioned offshore with their horns that were tuned the technology involved computers on each ship that basically controlled. Um, we were able to. We were basically working with this idea of how the, the resonance of the foghorn and the sound, the maritime sounds, travel out to sea, and how they're kind of shaped and reverberating, reverberated by the landscape. And so basically, the technology measures the physical distance from the shore, how the how the sound travels 
in that dis physical distance under different weather conditions how temperature affects it, how the wind direction affects it, and how the landscape affects it. So it's a very complex technological piece of work um, with a huge network of, of these vessels basically measuring when they were supposed to sound their horns. We knew that there was a certain element of chaos because although people were told they couldn't, they were not allowed to do anything, um, we knew that they would press the horns on the, on the wrong times. There was there was going to be a sponsor to be an element of chaos. So on the day, and nothing had worked, and um, we hadn't slept for a week, and it was just the, the press from the whole country was there, thousands of people arriving, um, uh, ships traveling from all over the place, being controlled into their positions. The weather looked really dubious. And, um, um, then we started the, um, the music and it worked. And I'd never heard, heard it work before and it was the most extraordinary sound. It was a very emotional experience and people were crying and the, um, I'll show a short sequence of it, but it was quite an amazing project to, to make because, it was, because we all made it together and because it could only really happen by everybody making it happen. And since then, um, the kind of reverberations about this kind of action, um, which felt like a kind of celebration, but also like a memorial, but it also felt like taking a sort of space back, um, was um, uh, people writing poems, people uh, making paintings from it, children books. It has had a huge kind of resonance in the local community of this project. This was the... Um, the last sound of the folk horn, which was a very strange sound, like a, a huge animal, so an animal that was dying, that was just letting go of its breath out over the sea. Um, quite sort of human in a sense. And I will finish this talk by um, just playing a, a, a sequence from this. Oh, sorry. I'm not connected to the sound. I'll just stop it. Where's the sound thing? It was here before, I think it's this one. Yeah.
inspiration really from the sounds, these two sounds of the football, this very brutal sound that you get when you're up close, and this very gorgeous sound that you get when you're miles away, a sound which has kind of picked up all the echoes of the landscape. So it's about listening to music across a landscape and all that that implies. And so I've tried to encompass those two sounds, those two foghorn sounds in the music. So I've got very gentle, sentimental kind of music on the one hand, and on the other kind of fierce, sea-tossed, storm-tossed music. Traveling to to uh, 
meet in one place just for the completely absurd reason of celebrating the sound. It's quite interesting. That's it.